Diet is really important to help manage your bowels, help manage fatigue, immune function, wound healing. And they're just a few of the benefits of diet. So over the next 20 minutes, um, we will have a look at what is the best diet for multiple sclerosis, essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6, specific diets that have been suggested for multiple sclerosis, namely the low-gluten, the best-bet diet, the swank diet, and the overcoming MS program, and also have a look at vitamin D and the current research on vitamin D. So compared to many other diseases and conditions, um, there's actually been quite limited research into diet and MS. And so the government recommendations that are based on the prevention of stroke, cardiovascular disease and cancer um, recommends a well-balanced diet. And a well-balanced diet should give you all the nutrients that you need to remain as active and healthy as possible. So a balanced diet is, re is recommended um, for everybody with multiple sclerosis, just like the general population. So what is a balanced diet? A balanced diet should look something like these circles that are on the screen. Um, over the whole day, so not in one meal, but over the whole day, you should aim to have plenty intake of fruits and vegetables. These have got lots of vitamins and minerals in, lots of fiber, and they can be fresh, frozen, um, or dried. Plenty of starchy carbohydrates, so your breads, rice, pasta, potato, and cereals. These are your main energy source. And if your body doesn't have enough of these, then what it does is it breaks down fat and then it breaks down protein to obtain the energy. And where possible, trying to go for whole grain varieties as um, these can help minimize constipation and also help potentially with fatigue as um, they're digested and broken down a lot more slowly. So they'll help keep your blood sugar levels a lot more stable and also keep you feeling fuller for longer. A proportion of dairy, so two to three portions of dairy to help with your calcium intake. And um, a proportion of protein, so meat, fish, eggs, or beans and pulses. And then the smaller section being foods that are quite high in fat and sugar. As this is a general recommendation, it may need to be altered slightly, um, depending on your individual circumstances. So if um, for example, somebody is overweight and you want to manage your weight a bit more effectively, you may need to increase your intake of fruits and vegetables and reduce the fats and sugar. Likewise, if you're underweight or you have a poor appetite, then you might want to actually increase the foods that are quite high in fat and sugar. Essential fatty acids um, are omega-3 and omega-6, and these are a healthy type of fat that fall under the umbrella of polyunsaturated fatty acids. The main sources of omega-6 are sunflower, soy, and soya oil, and also foods that are um, made from these oils, such as salad dressings, mayonnaise, etc. Generally, the whole population generally takes enough of omega-6 if you have a well-balanced diet. Omega-3, the main sources of omega-3 fats are from oily fish, so things like sardines, mackerel, and salmon. And if you are a vegetarian or have an aversion to fish, then the main sources would be from plant sources, namely um, leafy green vegetables or nuts and seeds, mainly linseeds and flax seeds. And I'll hand over to Dr. Chataway. So um, one of the things that was looked at in the NICE review, as you know, it's out for draft at the moment, but DART was looked at in quite detail as to whether there was or was not benefit in omega-3 and omega-6. But dietary trials are quite difficult uh, to do. The idea had come around, as you've heard, because they're gen general cardiovascular protective effect, not necessarily multiple sclerosis protective effects. So if we look at the evidence, the way they portrayed the evidence, they what are called forest plots. So anything to one side not touching the neutral line is of clear effect. So here's the omega-3. So for omega-3 to be effective, the whole of the diamond needs to be on that left side. If it crosses the neutral line and has wide areas, you say that there's not enough evidence either way. So really from this evidence, you wouldn't 
support omega-3 and also the other omega-6. This is the other omega-3 data. And these are trials in multiple sclerosis, looking at relapse rate, looking at progression. And again, you can see from the summary of the omega-3 data that it's really very much on the neutral line. So uh, apart from its general health benefits and cardiovascular health benefits, we couldn't say that it has clear anti-MS benefits. And this is the same for the omega-6. So the recommendation in draft for the NICE is that omega-3 and omega-6 is not recommended unless you want cardiovascular benefits. And I think that's worth saying, because people can spend a lot of money down at Holland and Barrett <laughs> on these things, and it may be not helping in what we want to help in terms of the MS. We'll talk about some of the other diets in more detail. Many diets have been suggested as therapies um, to help with multiple sclerosis in terms of managing symptoms and reducing relapse rate. So we'll talk about four of the most common, the evidence base and what the dietetic recommendations are. So the first one is the low-gluten diet. And gluten is a protein that's found in wheat, rye and barley. And when we've looked at the research, there's been 24 papers in total. These are on humans, not animals. Um, and all but one of these papers found no association between um, gluten intake and multiple sclerosis. The one study that did find an, an association was very, very small in sample size, with only nine people included. So... Overall, there is very limited evidence for us to actively promote a low-gluten diet in the, management of in, in the management of multiple sclerosis. However, if you do feel a personal benefit by excluding low-gluten, then you can have a well-balanced diet without gluten in your diet. Um, as long as you make relevant substitutions, so for example, the majority of gluten is found in the starchy carbohydrates, so as long as you substitute accordingly with things like gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta, maybe having more potatoes and rice, etc., cetera, um, then that should be fine. So I think I'll stop you there, Hayley, because I think certainly some of my patients, maybe you feel better with a lower mm -hmm. gluten diet. But if you are to do that, then it needs to be a balanced yeah. low gluten diet yeah. in that way. So not a celiac disease mm -hmm. diet, but a balanced low gluten diet. The next diet that has been suggested is called the best bet diet um, and this diet is based on the principle that MS is caused by a leaky gut so that intact proteins actually leak out of your bowel into the bloodstream and then that can exacerbate symptoms and cause MS. However um, the, the main consistency of the diet is that it recommends avoiding several food groups, including dairy, grains, red meat and legumes. It also suggests having allergy tests and taking up to 18 additional supplements. Currently, <laughs> currently there is no evidence base on this diet. Um, there's no research papers um, that has been completed on it, and there's also no evidence to suggest that MS is caused by a leaky gut either. So from, in terms of dietetic recommendations, this diet could result in multiple food restrictions and nutritional deficiencies, and it may also be expensive with the allergy tests and the supplements, and also the practicality of it, it may be quite difficult to stick to as well. So we wouldn't recommend that in terms of the management. The third diet is called the Swank diet, which some of you may have come across. Um, this was developed in the 1940s by Dr. Roy Swank, and the main principles of this diet are that saturated fat should be kept to less than 15 grams a day, unsaturated fat to 20 to 50 grams per day, no red meat for the first year, and then gradual reintroduction, no fat or 1% or less for dairy products, no processed foods contain unsaturated fat, and to take a cod liver oil and a multivitamin supplement. Currently, there's been only one large research trial, and that was done in the 1950s by Dr. Roy Swank. And what he did was he put a number of people on a low saturated fat diet, so less than 15 grams, and then he monitored how um, the MS outcomes, so 
to see how they did on it. But there were a number of limitations to this. Um, the, there was no control group, so he only put people on the low saturated fat diet. He didn't compare it with a control group. And, there, and in terms of research bias, the, the researchers actually knew who was able to stick to the diet and who wasn't when they were analysing all the data, so that could influence the results. So overall, again, we wouldn't actively promote this diet. However, if you do feel that it helps your symptoms and you want to try it, then the main things to be careful are um, is for your protein intake. Um, by reducing animal products like meat and dairy, your protein intake will be reduced, and so you'll need to substitute this with fish, beans, or pulses. And likewise, the diet could be very low in energy overall. So if you are underweight or losing weight or have a poor appetite, um, then the risks of you following this diet may outweigh the benefits. And the last diet is the Overcoming MS program. So this was developed by Professor George Jelinek in 1999. And it looks, as as, it looks at diet as part of a whole program. Um, in combination with exercise and meditation. It recommends cutting out dairy and meat and also reducing your saturated fat intake, so very similar to the Swank diet, and also taking a vitamin D and an omega-free supplement. So currently, a bit like the glow gluten, there's limited evidence. There has been one study that has been completed and, um, and published, and that did find an improvement in people's quality of life when they were on this, on this kind of program. And however, sorry, improvement in, qual in quality of life, and going, building on that data, um, an ongoing study is going on looking at relapse rate and disease progression. So hopefully in the next few years we might have more data on this diet but currently there's still not quite enough to suggest it. A bit like the Swank diet, it's not necessarily um, bad for you, but you do need to be careful with your protein intake, your dairy intake, and also if you are underweight or losing weight again, then you need to be very careful. So I think this is a very interesting diet, very current at the moment, and maybe some of you are on this diet. And there is, there is some hint of effect on quality of life, but not, not proven. But just, as Hayley said, in terms of a balanced dietetic um, regime, just think about some of these things, but uh, I think um, some of you may have been to some of his lectures, this is quite an interesting diet so those are some of the diets which have appeared, of course there have been many many more um, over the decade, but some of the major diets, and uh, Hayley you just and bring out yeah, these points just, just to conclude, if you do want to follow any of these diets then the main points to think about are what is the evidence base? Many of the diets are based on personal observations rather than randomised control trial trials. Um, think about, can you still enjoy your food? Are you restricting foods that you particularly enjoy or likewise having to take more food that you don't really enjoy? That in turn may, inf may affect your quality of life and your mood. Um, is it practical? <clears throat> so do you have family um, are you working? Do you socialise quite a lot? And also the financial aspect of it. Will it, if you have to eat more protein, for example, that might naturally be, be a bit more expensive. And will it affect you in maybe a negative way? So I've mentioned if you're underweight or losing weight, the risks and the benefits of that um, may not be clear. So it's just weighing it up on an individual basis. So, we have talked a little bit about vitamin D. Of course, it's a vast topic, and we don't want to get in too deep. Um, there's a epidemiological evidence that vitamin D may be in some way important in the development of multiple sclerosis. The question then arises, could it be an interventional product? Could you give vitamin D to reduce relapse rate or reduce progression? There's no doubt that vitamin D is very important in bone health, and in, in people with MS, bone health can be poor. Also, we know that many people have, are deficient um, in vitamin D, particularly in northern hemispheres. But here we're just going to talk a little bit more generally about vitamin D and maybe some of the doses to use if you're going to use vitamin D. The main source of vitamin D is exposure to sunlight. So when UV rays hit our skin, um, our body produces vitamin D. 
Very few foods actually contain vitamin D. The main source is oily fish and also additional foods that are fortified, such as margarine and cereal. However, in the UK, fortification is voluntary, um, so not all products will be fortified with vitamin D. The main causes of vitamin D deficiency, um, the biggest one is avoidance of sun exposure and also wearing um, sun cream and sun protective clothing. And in relation to multiple sclerosis, if you have reduced mobility and maybe you don't get outside as much, then naturally your sun exposure will be more limited. And people who have high skin pigmentation, this can decrease um, your production of vitamin D. So naturally, that is a risk factor for deficiency. Vitamin D can be tested via a blood test, um, measuring your serum 25 dihydro dihydroxy levels. Currently, there is no consensus on optimal um, um, status. It has been proposed as more than 75 nanomoles, but that's not a consensus. Um, and a deficient um, range we would class as less than 25 nanomoles. With regards to research, um, a systematic review in 2013 um, looked at all the trials that were randomised control, double-blinded placebo trials. And from this, there were only five. And these all had small study sizes, um, different dosage amounts, and also the type of vitamin D that was supplemented was different in each study. So four out of five of them showed no effect, and one out of five did show an improvement. However, there are ongoing trials as well, so it is an area that more, more research is ongoing and is needed. In terms of toxicity, um, you can't get um, toxic amounts from sunlight. However, in terms of supplementation, um, sometimes too much vitamin D may um, produce too much calcium in the blood. And this can have a knock-on effect on the kidneys. Um, and so the European Food Safety Authority recommends an upper limit of 4,000 international units. Um, we are awaiting, I think, a second scientific advisory committee nutrition report on the upper levels as well. should be out, I think, any time soon. Um, but it's not currently published at the moment. So due to the evidence base, we should all try to aim to get vitamin D through exposure to sunlight and food sources where possible. However, this may be difficult for some groups. Um, the Department of Health does recommend supplementation for specific groups. These include pregnancy, lactation, Asian women and children, and those aged over 65 due to the benefits of bone health. Um, and in terms of the UK, it is estimated that about 50% of adults are deficient in vitamin D due to the geographic location. And so in terms of measuring baseline vitamin D um, and also supplementing, it's very individual if you want to and also if, you want to, if um, consultants want to prescribe it as well. Um, but if you are on supplements recommend to check your levels annually and also check the calcium levels as well. And currently there is no current evidence for optimal dosage, but that is ongoing. So again, hopefully in the next few years we might know more. And I think that's right. This is an active area. I mean, I might say 4,000 or 5,000. The, the actual limit is not known, but more information will come available over the next year. So it's a moving target in terms of the actual dose of vitamin D. And so just to summarise, we should all aim to have a well-balanced diet and maintain a healthy body, body weight where possible. If you do wish to follow um, one of those specific diets, just have a think about the risks and the benefits. And if you do have any concerns about any food restrictions or your weight, then um, consult a dietitian. And vitamin D supplements may be beneficial, and I think the key is the monitoring um, of the levels to see whether supplements are needed, and ongoing research as well. Great. Thanks very much, Hayden. Thank you very much. <laughs>